Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Petronos Podcast. This is episode 70 of the Petronos Podcast. My name is Trisha Curtis. I am the CEO of Petronos and the host of the Petronos Podcast. And boy, do I have a very special treat for you today. So for listeners who love the short and sweet episodes, and I know there are not many, um, but the folks that really tune into both the podcast and the short videos that I do, these two-minute videos where I compress everything to a couple minutes, this is the podcast for you. So this is a very short 15-minute presentation, um, and it is a special treat because this is the presentation that I gave at the Oxford Institute for Energy Studies at Oxford University um, in England on uh, December 2nd of 2022. So, And this is all U.S. shale. So everything going on in the U.S. shale space in 15 minutes, and I actually talk a little bit slower. It's a very uh, – it's, it's a, a – pretty well thought out presentation where I go through soup to nuts, what's going on with natural gas prices, what's going on with rural private operators, stuff I've been talking about for a while, but very nicely condensed in this presentation. But today is January 18th, 2023. And a lot has changed um, in terms of pricing for natural gas prices. Um, and a lot has changed since December 2nd. Um, not much has actually changed on the, on the oil pricing front. So just to timestamp this, when this podcast was recorded, when I gave this presentation, which you'll hear shortly, WTI was 79.98, um, Brent was 85.57, Henry Hub was 6.28, about double, more than double what we are today, um, and Dutch TTF was a whopping 41.77. So Dutch TTF and Henry Hub had obviously still come off their highs, but they were still really high. Today is Wednesday, January 18, 2023, and we are seeing 78.51 WTI, which we, we were at 80 and changed this morning, um, 84.09 for Brent. Henry Hub is at 329. We've seen massive, massive sell uh, compression um, within natu- or Henry Hub and natural gas. Dutch TTF is uh, w- Dutch TTF is, is way down as well. We're seeing 10 bucks for, or sorry, 20 bucks for Dutch TTF. Correction, sorry. Dutch TTF is actually 19 bucks and change. So we have seen Dutch TTF come off an absolute cliff um, from the highs of $100 uh, in August, and obviously the 41 that we were seeing in December. So we are also seeing. Um, if, if you're feeling like you have whiplash right now um, with what's going on with the stock market and what's going on with China and the energy space, you are not the only one. There's a lot of confusion, I think, in the market in this. Uh, I keep saying this over and over, but it's very true. I think 2022, you could characterize as, as volatility. In 2023, the first 18 days are shaping up to just be incredible uncertainty because you have a slug of very nuanced, different economic data um, that the market is having a hard time digesting and the stocks are are doing one thing, um, but the economic the economic situation on the ground is doing something completely different. Um, so with the ten year yield, we have seen that really come off as well. We are at a uh, three point three seven percent for the 10 year yield that has really come down so when that goes up we see 30 year mortgage rates go up so today with that 10 year yield coming down we have seen the 30 year mortgage around six percent about six point oh four percent for the 30 year mortgage that does not mean that if you were to go out and get a mortgage today that it would be six percent i so you're still google that you're still going to be in the seven percent range for the average person six percent regardless is still extremely high means your monthly payment has come down a little from seven percent but no one was buying houses at 7%. I doubt many people would be buying them at 6 um, That being said, home builder sentiment was positive, slightly more positive than it has been because it's been nose diving off a cliff. Uh, so there's some positive sentiment in terms of, hey, if mortgage rates continue to come down, that will be positive. I don't really see mortgage rates coming down. I don't see the Fed pivoting. Um, the market is, while it's not calling for a Fed pivot, is calling for um, cuts, I think, eventually in the year or, or thinking that inflation is really going to come down and the Fed is going to react to that. Well, inflation did come down last week. We saw inflation at 6.5%. And the problem is we didn't see – we core inflation, when you're stripping out energy and food, um, has not really come down. So we've, we still see food inflation north of 10%. And core inflation, which includes shelter, which includes housing, is really high. It has continued at a breakneck pace. It has not stopped. It has not slowed down. It's at 7.5%. And we still see, we're seeing really high electricity prices. So even though we've seen a massive drop-off in gasoline prices, which was one of the single biggest drivers in the drop 
um, in inflation in the inflation data, we haven't seen electricity prices go down. And so the average person, you know, when the lower income, not just in, in the U.S., but across the world, their spending is most of their disposable income is going to housing and it's going to food and it's going to fuel. And so those three big items, yes, you have a little bit more in your pocket if gasoline prices are down, but you don't have, I mean, if electricity prices remain elevated and if food costs remain elevated, that is still a problem. And I lastly, I just really want to point out that just because inflation is coming down does not, inflation is where prices for things have increased, okay? So unless they go back to what they were, we aren't seeing it. I mean, the when inflation rates are coming down to 6.5% from 8, 8% and change, that means the rate of price increases is coming down. That does not mean that the prices have went to what they were pre-COVID. That is really, really serious. And so when we're talking about what we were seeing in the UK of 10% inflation, yes, energy prices are coming down, but that stickiness in inflation is something we're seeing on the wage side. So if you just go to U.S. Bureau of Economic Statistics or U.S. US Labor um, U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, what you're going to see is um, the headlines, right? They're going to have these headlines and they're going to say, um, yes, the CPI, your consumer price index is down, um, but wage prices are up. So uh, productivity is down. And um, it, so you don't, wage prices are up, productivity is down, and payroll data is good. And we're now at 3.5% unemployment. So you still have a very sticky, um, you still have a very sticky unemployment piece where we have wage prices still going up. And that's something I, I've talked about before, but that's something that's does not want to see is wage price spirals. And then we are seeing, um, and you're seeing tightness still in the labor market where you don't have enough people um, applying for jobs and you have too many job openings. And really the Fed is going to have to increase unemployment to really cool this economy. So that's um, something not really being digested, I think, well within the stock market. Um, we saw some some things going on with the stock market today where um, we, we had some sell up. We, it's been up and it's been down. And uh, you know the pundits are all over the map on what's going on. So for every person you can say we're going to a deep recession. You have somebody saying we're not going to recession. And then you have another person saying this will be a mild recession. And the thing I have to talk about, the thing I, I would say about this recession is I, I absolutely think we're, we're most of the economy or, or half of the economy is sort of already in one. Um, we do see credit card debt in the U.S. going up. Um, when you have high interest rates, if you are missing a payment, your your debt payments are going up significantly. Um, we are seeing, uh, so we have this tightness in the labor market, right? So we have the bottom half of the, the U.S. really feeling, and the bottom half of the world, really feeling the pains of inflation, still feeling the pains of inflation, high food costs, high fuel costs, high electricity costs, things like that. Um, and they've already spent through all their savings, and they have high interest payments if they have credit card debt. That's all really problematic, and that's sort of in the system. And then we have the top half, to upper half of the economy, where we're, we're seeing job layoffs, massive job layoffs, in tens of thousands of job layoffs. Massive might be a bigger, a, a too big a word, but significant job layoffs in the tech space. We've seen that from Facebook, Meta. We see it in Goldman Sachs. We are seeing it from. Um, Hiring freezes are now turning into layoffs, and so we've seen Microsoft and Amazon add to their add to their layoffs. Where you're seeing Amazon is set to erase 28,000 corporate jobs. So these are some pretty significant numbers, and those are these are high paying jobs. These are not your these are not folks in um you know in in, in the labor on the labor side that are they're packaging up these items. And I'm assuming they'll be laying off some of those as well as things slow down. But when we talk about corporate jobs, the Facebook, um, Amazon, all these Microsoft, these are jobs probably well north of $100,000 a year. So that's just important to put in perspective of sort of, I think this is a tale of two different types of recessions. This is very unseen, nuanced territory um, for, for most economists. And I think we we have simply not been in recessionary territory like this because we have not seen a COVID, a post-COVID environment with massive fiscal stimulus and then uh, a war in Ukraine and the, the energy implications that we've seen. And with that, I, I will say the energy piece is really, really jarring because I the question I probably get the most after presentations and a lot from clients and, and briefings that I'm doing is, where are we at in ESG? And is the momentum cooling on that? And I certainly think it is from an investor standpoint. I think that if you are, you know, the big money, the hedge funds, everyone, people know that ESG is not actually making money. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, massive kudos and props to Chris Wright for coming out and putting a bunch of stuff on LinkedIn on zero poverty um, and really taking a completely different line on uh, not on net zero. Um, and I think more publicly traded companies have been vocal about that need to do that. Um, but I, this is really serious in terms of 
where are we at sort of on this issue of momentum? And I think, so the money is pulling out of that. We do see that, but the leaders of these countries, and so if you're looking in Davos, Switzerland, the World Economic Forum that's taking place today, um, I, I would tell people to listen to the speeches, but quite honestly, I listened to several last night. I listened to um, the one from the, the Chinese uh, representative. I listened to Ursula von der Leyen from the European Commission. And I listened to the energy, the uh, energy panel that they had. And I nearly, my, my hair was nearly on fire and I was um, going, my blood was boiling because what we hear is China saying, hey, we're committed to our 2030 uh, net zero emissions or, or 2030 uh, peaking at, or keep peaking our carbon emissions and then our net zero by 2060. Ursula von der Leyen is doubling down on clean tech and saying that China or that um, they need to they need to work through their relationships with China and they need to make Europe the clean tech hub. And then you've got um, Fatih Barol with the International Energy Agency on a panel with Vicky Holub, and they're talking about everybody's talking about how green tech is wonderful. And you've got Vicky Holub apologizing to the panel and saying apologizing that she's critical of the windfall taxes because these oil companies uh, were actually investing in renewables. And I think she should have not been as apologetic and should have been a little more clear that the windfall taxes are really bad for actual ESG for actually investing in energy with a high BTU output that contributes, directly contributes to the wealth and health of the consumer and the stuff that Chris Wright is talking about in terms of net or in terms of zero poverty. And so this, we, we have a really completely uh, disconnect in reality of how folks are, are perceiving, how folks are perceiving what's going on, this, the, especially in this clean tech space. And so the International Energy Agency, Fatih Barol, he was on this panel and he's talking about doubling down on clean energy. There was a big new, they have a new flagship report from the IEA that comes out basically monthly now, but there's a new flagship report on energy technologies that I, I encourage you guys to take a look at. Um, and the reason I encourage you to take a look at that is because there's there's so much emphasis on China, basically the entire supply chain. And this is uh, obviously a lot of stuff for re the renewable sector, whether it's um, where we're talking batteries or solar panel components or photovoltaics, or we're talking about graphite and copper and all these things. But a lot of that also impacts uh, just day-to-day -day stuff, stuff that goes in your cell phone, um, stuff that the military uses. So this, these rare earth minerals, not necessarily all that rare, but the metals and processing of all this stuff is not just for renewables and for um, the energy transition and clean tech. It impacts a lot of other things. But the point is there's some really great charts in there that show how exposed the global economy is um, to China alone. And instead of th there's no sort of critical angle to that it's just saying you know china has to be a part of this and that's sort of what ursula von der Leyen with the european commission was saying as well of how important china is um it is to play in the space and that is just a it's it's not a realistic way of looking at the world and this is what this is what uh europe did with russia when they had uh nearly 18 BCF a day of natural gas exposure to imports in 2021 and the situation that we're in today with them having to um, get natural gas from other places and creating a global energy crisis. So the story, I think, with, with China is simply not, uh, we're, we're not done with that story. I'm going to be talking about it a lot um, in the future. Um, the podcast that's going to drop after this one, episode 71, is a talk I did in Pittsburgh where I talk about China and ESG um, at the end of it at, in a pretty big, uh, in, in length uh, to a degree. Um, but I think the, the data that we're seeing out of China right now, very important to watch because it is helping to drive energy prices up. It's helping to drive oil, oil prices up for sure. Um, we, we did see that pause in oil prices today and a slight pullback. Um, I, I caution everyone on the Chinese economic data because if it, our exposure to China is not, I mean, our exposure to China in terms of the stuff we're buying, you know, that's one thing. But our exposure to China in terms of the global economy, everyone thinking that they're going to increase their oil demand and they're opening up and things are great. Um, their economy was not doing well prior to COVID. It wasn't doing well during COVID. And now the fact that they're admitting that they have to do some stimulus measures and everything is really admitting that they have significant problems with the economy. And the government, um, so you, if you're following the tech space, Alibaba, different Tencent, different things going on with the tech space, you're seeing these things called golden shares. And this is where the this is where the government is going in and, and purchasing or owning chunks of these companies. And that that means that the stuff that Xi Jinping has said a year and two years ago with the big tech crackdowns, that's not really changing. They're just trying to move forward and get Western investors to continue to invest in this stuff. And they're doing this through a, a lot of this. I think they'll be doing through a conduit through through Hong Kong. But there's going to be a lot more on that. This is very interrelated in terms of the economy, in terms of the human rights abuses in China, and also in terms of uh, energy prices and what's going on in that space, and, and very much in terms of clean tech and and how we see that um, and how people are, are perceiving ESG. So with 
with that, um, I know that's a lot to take in, but that is your that is your recap of the market for January 18th, 2023. And with this next, uh, really hope you guys enjoy this presentation. I had a blast with it. And um, this is U.S. shale in a nutshell. We are at 12.4 million barrels per day, 122 BCF a day of production. Um, hope you guys appreciate it. Talk to you soon. Bye. Okay. So... Um, that's not my font, but anyways, that's, I thought that it's a good title. I, the U.S., I do think, is the unconventional, I mean, obviously, unconventional oil swing producer. If you guys know me um, or are familiar with me, I think I've seen you guys, um, most of you, in years past. I'm pretty passionate about this space. Actually, I, I've cut my teeth on U.S. shale. I know it very well, um, but I spend a lot of my time explaining geopolitics and everything you guys do in the room to operators in the US and to service companies, um, to various governments, and tying this all together. So this is one component, and I would say all these things that you guys are talking about and doing, it's extremely important in terms of thinking about energy security. And I would say one of the things no one's paying attention to is, is a lot of what's going on in US shale and the dynamics taking place in the US shale space. Uh, so, okay, so the big takeaway is from this presentation, the major takeaways is you know the rise in production growth. So we've had a rise in production in U.S. shale. Um, we don't hear a lot of media. You don't hear Bloomberg or CNBC or the White House or anyone talking about the U.S. being the largest producer of oil and gas in the entire world by a pretty big margin right now. Um, and it's significant because I don't think we're not hearing. You're not actually hearing OPEC talk about it a ton either. Um, Gas productivity, um, there's a nuance that we have right now where we have high natural gas prices. And over the course of the shale revolution, we have not had high natural gas prices. So this is the first time I would say since, think about 2008 to now, when we've seen sustainably high gas prices. This is an opportunity where you see operators, um, individual operators actually targeting gas reservoirs. And I think that's different um, because that comes out with their numbers, if they're publicly traded, whether it's variable equivalent or whether it's barrels per day. You've seen articles in the Wall Street Journal that are relatively negative on US shale, it's talking about the frackers slowing down. I mean, they're not actually the frackers or the shalers, but anyways. Um, they're not necessarily slowing down and they're not necessarily declining productivity, but there's a lot of nuances there between a lot of associated gas and high gas prices. And boy, do we have a lot of gas in the US. Um, and then there's the public-private split and the sort of the rise of these private operators. And the reason why this is all really relevant is because this, this stuff is stuff people would have told you wasn't gonna happen. So pre-COVID, um, you know, COVID, if you talk to a big private equity firm, they would have told you, or most people would have told you that the private guys are dead, right? That you're just not gonna have you know, dozens of little private companies in the Permian, that, the, that those days were over, and the market was not gonna support one and two rig companies. And what happened during COVID was the opposite, that you have a ton of one and two rig companies and a lot of bigger privates as well in the Permian Basin. And when I show you where they're drilling, it really makes you start questioning the whole tier one to tier four acreage and we don't have enough acreage and it's not very good. Well, when prices go up, a lot of the acreage that people thought wasn't very good turns out to be pretty okay. Um, and so you're seeing, and I can tell you from experiences of working with these private operators, they are very methodical. Um, they are not just doing the stuff willy nilly, pumping a bunch of sand down here. When they spend the money in a high inflationary environment, in a high cost environment, in a labor shortage environment, they take this very seriously. So they want to get good returns. They are getting good returns. Um, and so it's, it paints a very more nuanced picture um, than I think what you're probably seeing publicly because we have so many private operators. And then we do have a lot of rigs running. We've been at sort of the pre-COVID levels for a while, especially if you think about efficiency gains that we've had in the rig space, just using the best rigs to start with, drilling exceptionally longer laterals, and being just very efficient. In early pre -COVID, you know, post-COVID, when people were running and gunning and bringing these rigs back, things looked really good. Um, you were, you know, the efficiencies were great. And then we've started seeing a point where um, we have labor shortages and we don't have the right people on the rigs. And I think there's a little bit of tightness there, but the lateral lengths are significantly longer, which I'll show you. Um, we are seeing the productivity is a nuanced story, um, but we definitely have efficiencies there. And so if you have a little declining productivity, but you have three mile, mile long laterals and you are in, you're stretching your acreage, it doesn't look that bad. Um, and then the public operator ESG and investor pressure, I, am, I have a very different stance on ESG than almost most, I mean, most people that talk about this publicly. Um, I think it's very serious. The investor pressure that um, public companies, and there was a lot of burning of, of cash. We've talked about this in years past. That's for sure. The shale sector burned a lot of money. So there's definitely an incentive to give returns, right, back to your shareholders. Lots of share buybacks, lots of dividends now. 
Um, but there's also this ESG pressure, and it was massive. And I would say there's a huge amount of tailwinds when the Biden administration came in that helped push a lot of this. And most companies signed on, most independent operators, most majors signed on to a net zero plan. Um, I do think it's a little bit all for naught, considering that you know, in terms of CO2 emissions, US production is 1% of CO2 emissions. So if every oil and gas company in America signed on to net zero, we're not really hitting a drop in the bucket. Um, but that, there's a reality in terms of um, Biden administration policies and the negativity on shale is extremely important to think about in the context of what I'm gonna actually show you, that what shale has done despite all of that negativity. And we have, this is the most negative uh, administration against oil and gas, domestic oil and gas production in the US by far. We've never seen an administration quite like this in terms of the actual rhetoric, the getting on TV, the policies and everything. Um, that being said, so we have clawed our way back here. So we are at 12.3 million barrels a day of production in the US um, as of September. So I believe last year when I dialed in and did the virtual thing here, you know, we were all talking about easily, you know, closing the year at 12 million barrels per day. Obviously, we're doing that. So the pre-high is here at 13 million barrels a day. We can get there. It's a, there's a lot of caveats to that of how that actually gets done. Um, but there's the sort of slow and steady. And you can see this recent uptick. It's not so slow and steady. It's, it's pretty much there. Um, and the nuances behind this are very deep because you're not having massive production growth in the Rockies because you have a lot of you have a lot of public operators who have slowed down. You do have a lot of production growth in the Permian Basin and a lot of acceleration in activity. Um, but it's important to think about these price chunks. So I, I think you know 2000 to 2007 we averaged 44 dollars a barrel. 2008 to 2013, 88 dollars a barrel, and 2014 to 21 was a total 58 dollars a barrel. And so this new world of these higher prices is definitely the incentive for these private guys to go to town. Um, natural gas, I mean, I, I can't overstate it enough of how much natural gas we have in the US, how easy it is to get out of the ground, and how it's favorable right now in terms of these prices. So as long as you have the takeaway capacity, if I'm an operator, I should be, I mean, it's, it's a good thing to be going after this nat gas. Um, so over 120 BCF a day of US production. That is over a quarter of the world's supply and demand of natural gas. Um, and yes, we can produce a lot more very easily, especially if we were to actually build a pipeline out of any major basin. Um, and that, that's not targeting gas. So we have less than 200 rigs targeting natural gas. We have these high prices. And so we, need, we have basically almost 20 BCF a day coming out of the Permian Basin alone, uh, which is huge. Rig count, I won't spend time on this. That's just to show you that um, oil rigs is purple. Permian is red. And so you can see that it's not just the Permian Basin, that there's a lot more drilling going on, not just in the Permian Basin. That being said, the best example for increased lateral length is in the Permian. This is the Midland. So it's you know, shallower, a little well more known. Um, that's Delaware, that's increased as well. But in the Midland, you are seeing over 11,500 foot laterals on average. You're seeing a lot of companies drill 15,000 foot laterals. And when you think about that, that's three miles down, right? And so three miles is a long way to go. There was a lot of concerns, I think, early on. When you complete the end of that, you know, the very end of that tow, are you gonna get everything back? Clearly, you're not getting, you know, it's not exactly the same. So when we see the productivity numbers, this makes sense to me. Um, it also makes sense that there's room for improvement um, and tinkering. And this is what the productivity, this is oil and gas productivity for all major shale plays. And this is normalized, so this is not just, uh, this is normalized to 10,000 foot laterals. And what's quite impressive is that's 2021 in blue. So it's all your Rockies, your Eagle Ford, everything, all together. And then there's your red, um, which is 2022. And then here's your gas. And you'll notice the gas has improved. And that is telling, because this is your oil plays. So it's telling you that um, gas is favorable and people are going after it. It also makes sense why oil would be a little underneath. So there's a lot of nuances at play here. And you really have to look at individual operators and what they're targeting um, to see where we're going with this. This is the iHeart Net Zero. Everybody jumped on it. I think it is extremely serious for, in terms of uh, putting your drill back into the ground at $100 oil. I think more companies should have been drilling and not focusing as much on this. And now they're gonna have to walk this back a little bit uh, because it isn't as trendy. Um, the federal land permit approvals, this is very serious. This is uh, just per, per, for perspective. This is B Bureau of Land Management, federal permits. 
That's Trump administration in red. I'm not criticizing or, or favoring anything here, but that's Biden in blue. Um, the Biden administration immediately canceled Keystone XL, immediately su suspended all permits on federal land day one that went on for two months. And then you can't actually re-up a permit. I mean, you can have a federal permit, and if it expires, it's very hard to get that approved again. Over every administration, including Obama, you were able to do that before, not under this administration. And so you have a declining in permit approvals. You have no lease sales on federal lands. So that's all really serious. Um, and then if we look at just these, where these public and privates are at, and I know this looks like a lot. It's a, there's a, it's a great takeaway slide. Purple is private companies. Uh, orange is public companies. And so you can just see here where the publics are at and where the privates are at. And the public companies are very concentrated and cored up, and the private companies are sort of everywhere. And that tells you they're willing to take the risks. Um, high prices make a lot of this acreage look more favorable. And trust me, they're not just throwing this money away. They can't. The investors are not giving them, giving them the money to do that. Um, so it tells you a lot what's going on. And you can see this is the private rig count. We have, way, we have more private rigs running than we have public rigs running. That's really serious. They're basically at 2018 highs, or nearly at 2018 highs, and the publics haven't come back. That's shareholder pressure. That's these public companies wanting to return money to their investors, all valid, um, but also slow to the uptake. And this is your drilled but uncompleted wells, which you can just say these are wells sort of waiting on completion. They're not strategic ducks necessarily but they're the holes that were poked or being poked into the ground. And so one, they should tell you that there's a lot of private activity because these are holes being poked in the ground um, and that's where the publics are at, less activity, but still a ton. And it means there's a lot of production. So it means there's a lot of activity and there's a lot of forthcoming production. And New Mexico, this is just a state perspective. So I think it's really important to appreciate that 12.3 million barrels per day, Where's that, where is that coming from? And if you look at this, this is California's on decline, Alaska's on decline, Colorado, we had regulatory issues and we've, we've still been on decline. So major states that are just continuing to decline, where in New Mexico, two counties in Lee and Eddy County alone are producing 1.7 million barrels per day, just breakneck growth. So when you hear about companies like EOG or, Pion or not Pioneer, but EOG and others that have multiple assets across the country, they're declining or flattening production maybe in the Bakken, but they're not in the Delaware. And so this growth is huge. I mean, this is some of the best rock in the entire world. Um, it, it just, it's really meaningful to put this in perspective of how quickly this is growing. Um, I know companies in Colorado that had nothing and have 40,000 barrels a day, and that's what Bahrain produces. Um, so 1.7 million barrels a day for two counties is a really big deal. And if you break this out, and I'm, I'm almost done, so I think I've done this pretty quickly. If you break this out, this is US completions, all US completions, all the wells. So forget rigs and forget ducks and all that. This is the wells we've drilled, completed, and brought onto production. This is where we were, the total, just this total stack line bar. That's where we were pre-COVID, um, and that's where we're at now. So we haven't climbed back quite to where we were before. And if we break this out, you can see, and I do attribute a lot of this to ESG and investor pressure for publics. But these are private companies. That line is the, the bar is the actual completions by the uh, private companies. The purple line is the rig count of the private companies. And the black line is WTI. So you can see private companies respond quickly to oil prices because they can. They have the flexibility to do that. Public companies, it's a different story. They have a lot more pressures and incentives. And they haven't responded. And that is why basins like the Bakken, um, the areas in the Rockies, and Eagleford that had a lot of public exposure haven't climbed back yet. And with that, um, I covered a little bit, but I'm going to conclude. So thank you very much.